welcome to A Thrivable Future, the podcast covering all things to do with sustainability, thrivability, and the important policy changes happening around the world. Hi, I'm Rebecca from The Thrive Project, the not-for-profit research and advocacy group. I'll be your host as we talk with our experts and special guests about all the thrivability matters affecting the world today. Before I introduce this week's guest, I would like to recognise Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as the first peoples of this place now known as Australia. We respect the elders of the past and present, and we are grateful for the continuing care of the lands, waterways and skies, where we listen, learn and thrive. This week, I am pleased to welcome Caroline Pidcock to talk us through sustainable infrastructure and also the role of feminism in her approach to sustainable design. Carolyn Pickcock is an Australian architect and a prominent advocate for sustainable development. Her authentic interest and experience in architecture, biophilia and regenerative design has been developed and enhanced through over 30 years involvement in a diverse range of professional, academic and community commitments. Welcome, Caroline, and thank you for joining me. Thanks very much, Rebecca. Now, I just want to ask, because you've got such a great career working in the architectural space, we've got this big global goal of net zero by 2050. What kind of changes do you think we'll need to see to meet this goal on an architectural level? Well, I actually reckon the 2050 goal is just too far away. We actually need a 2030 goal, followed by an even more ambitious 2035 (laughs) goal because if we haven't got it sorted by then, we won't be getting it sorted. And I think if you go to Climate Council and a whole lot of the scientists who are the people I think one should go to in this instance. (laughs) The real goal, if we want to keep heating below 1.5 degrees by 2030, is 75% reduction. People go, oh, but how can we afford to do that? How do we do it? And it's like, well, how can we Can we afford not to? Yeah. (laughs) I mean, at the moment, the current climate change scenarios we're experiencing, Europe is experiencing, America is experiencing. I mean, there was a bushfire on the edge of, A village on the edge of London burst into flame from fire. This is climate change at one degree increase in temperature. Yeah. And the scientific analysis says to limit this to 1.5, which is another half a degree, which is exponential in the impact, we have to reduce our emissions by 75%. So my thinking is we've got to do everything we can to do that because... If we don't, the human race might not survive. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I completely agree with you. I think that a lot of people, like the kind of resistance we see is that we're not quite feeling those, like it's not an immediate enough threat to... I think if you go and talk to anyone in Lismore, if you go and talk to anyone down on the south coast who've been experiencing bushfires and floods and are still living in tents, I think they would disagree with you. We are not insulated from this. Yeah, we are definitely starting to see those. And we've got to stop saying it's not really happening because it absolutely is. And all the scientists are terrified because what's happening at the moment is happening even faster than they put into their worst-case scenarios. I don't mean to sound alarmist or doomist or whatever. I'm just stating the facts. And then saying the human race needs to radically change what we're doing. I think we're going to end up with a better way of living, but it is absolutely not what we're doing now and it's not tweaking what we're doing now. It's radical change. There's so many positives attached to the change that I think people miss the picture there. Yeah. I mean, I just think that ultimately people are looking for happiness which comes from doing good things with good people and having purpose in your life. And none of that requires excessive consumption. In fact, I think excessive consumption and destruction detracts from all of that. And so we've just got to stop listening to the people telling us that that's what we need in order to be happy and actually find it in other ways of being in the world. If we don't all thrive, particularly nature, the human race is so dependent on nature. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we are. We like to think that we're not because, you know, we don't think about the connections of the world that we live in, but the reality is that we are very dependent on those resources. 
When you think about that 2030 radical transformation, what does that look like to you? So from an architect and built environment perspective, yeah. um, I just think that the best thing we could do right now is to stop building new buildings, just right. train up everyone within the industry to really approach our existing building stock and work out how to retrofit it to be totally electrified and much more efficient and much more beautiful. There's a movement in the UK called retrofitting. When you build a new building, there's a huge amount of embodied carbon in that beginning stage that generally is amortised over the whole life. But right at the moment, as we are trying to reduce carbon significantly, that big burden <laughs> of embodied carbon is significant and every bit of carbon counts. If you drive around or catch a train around, you see... Humans have degraded so many places around our cities and within our cities. And you go, well, why don't we just fix them up and plant more plants, make them more desirable for people to live in and fix up the buildings? To me, that's the best place to start. So how does that impact with the situation where we've got an increasing amount of, say, homeless population at the moment? If we're stopping building new buildings because we want to retrofit existing ones, how does that interrelate with the demand for housing, particularly as we're seeing increased homelessness throughout Australia? Um, well, the other thing to do is for all the people who've got houses, their second and third houses that they're not occupying, let's start rethinking that. My understanding is there's about 300,000 empty homes around Australia, which correlates with how many homeless people there are. And you sort of go, oh, but people are entitled to have this. We are heading for a climate disaster. So if we want to actually say, how do we fix this? We need to rethink everything. We need to rethink everyone's right to own places. We need to rethink how big a home needs to be and whether we can actually, in retrofitting some of these homes, we might adapt some of those huge McMansions to be able to house two or three families or two families and an individual, you know, because people really don't need or use all the space that we've got. What I'm saying might sound really unrealistic, but what to me sounds really unrealistic, that the human race can know what we know and not change things. There is definitely like an embedded reluctance. It's not fair. Why should I have to give up this dream or the, this desire? I suppose the reality is that that's going to happen. I think we've got to get a sense of what is enough. Yeah. What is sufficient for me to have a really good life? What is sufficient for the human race? At the moment you go into the city and there's a whole lot of office buildings that are so under-occupied. I mean, we can probably transform a whole bunch of buildings into housing people on a temporary basis. I mean, there's different ways of thinking that we've got excessive space in certain places and not enough places to house people. Are there restrictions from like a legislative level in terms of making that transformation? Sure, and they need to be changed. I think the councils are up for that. And it's not to say that people shouldn't come into the city, they should, but it's looking like they're not going to come back 100%. Well, people don't want to, I mean. <laughs> if there's 20 or 30% of space that's not really going to be utilised and we could utilise it better, why yeah, would, it makes why sense. would we collectively think about that? And I also think that there's a whole lot of spaces in the regional country towns. There's a whole lot of places that can provide homes and good places for people to work in other areas as well. It doesn't all have to be in the inner city. Do you think that we would need better infrastructure in terms of travelling for that to be viable as a solution? Enriching the regions and reconnecting them with good trains and good internet yep. is critical. Do you know there used to be trains that connected every single country town in, in New South Wales to Sydney and, and probably, you know, in, in a whole lot of areas and they've been overlooked and ignored uh, and is train the best system don't know but maybe electric buses on a more regular system there's options and I just think that we've got to think about it differently to say well how do we ensure that these places where people can live how can we connect them or near them well to the city for when people do need to come to the city there might just be hubs where people come to and then there's a yeah. electric bus or something that comes I mean, you know, the world has changed dramatically in the last few years for what is possible from a renewable sense. And I think our thinking needs to adapt and change with that as well. 
Yeah, I mean, there definitely needs to be a cultural shift in demand and expectations as well, I think. But when you're trying to plan this, like especially on an infrastructural level, what kind of challenges crop up in trying to bring about that change? Two of the biggest challenges for people starting to use more public transport is there is a concept that perhaps only poor people use public transport. It's not true, but yeah. (laughs) Not true, but a number of very rich people think that. Yeah. And that's incorrect. I think the other thing is that if you do use public transport, it's your individual freedom to go from exactly where you want to go to exactly where you want to go in exactly the time frame you want to go is trickier. Yeah. And if you do use public transport, you need to probably plan a bit more in advance and work around a few other ideas, all of which are entirely possible. Yeah. And yes, it takes longer, but I'm not suggesting this just to be difficult. I'm suggesting this to try and work out how the human race can continue. So yeah, kind of a very big ambition <laughs> we need to achieve. And I just think if someone came up with a better way, great. But, you know, even if they're electric cars, there's still so much embodied energy in making those cars and moving around that it's much more efficient if we can move um, a whole lot more people together. But that's where I think we just need to readjust our thinking and planning based on what's now with with a whole lot of different things available, but with the main aim of how do we reduce emissions substantially. Well, one of the things we see are electric scooters that people can ride around. Electric bikes are fantastic, you know. Yeah. (laughs) Sure. Guess what? It rains. Yeah, you know, so get the right clothing. Yeah. <laughs> and look, there are going to be times where you really have to go in a car. Great. But that cannot be 100% of the current times. Yeah. There are other ways. I mean, I've been catching trains. I've been to Brisbane by train and Melbourne a couple of times by train. And people go, oh, but doesn't it take a long time? Yes, it does. But then you work out, well, how do you make the most of that journey? And the ones to Melbourne I did overnight and slept. There are also faster trains available as well. <laughs> that would be a great thing. <laughs> you know, on the way to Brisbane, I took a book that I've been meaning to read and we just read it. An advantage, I think, that really gets overlooked when you talk about public transport is that you don't have to be paying attention. We were so enjoying the countryside that we drove through and reading a book and, you know, having a cup of coffee, all very relaxed. Yeah. And I just think that we have got to re-examine our lives that just put this unnecessary time pressure on everything because that whole concept causes more destructive behaviour than anything else. It's not good for our well-being to, you know, like always be having to hustle and... And rush and not spend time with people you love and not do things you want to do. You know, while we're refiguring the whole world, we just need to... (laughs) That is a really good place to start. (laughs) Definitely. Now, I wanted to ask you, what is regenerative design? Everyone's heard, you know, if you give a person a fish, they'll eat for a day. And then they say, but you can teach them to fish and they can eat for a lifetime. Uh Uh-huh. If you teach them to love the ocean, together they and the ocean will thrive for all time. Right. That is what regenerative thinking design development is about. It's about understanding the systems that you're working in and falling in love with them again and ensuring that all your decisions ensure all parts of that system thrive together. And it's not an extractive, as long as I'm doing all right, If you teach someone to fish, they might fish the oceans out like they are at the moment. Yeah. But if you love the ocean, you will help make the ocean healthier. I suppose it's having that preservation relationship with the natural world. I think our Indigenous people know a lot of stuff. We've got a lot to learn from them. If you want to talk about time, I think Indigenous people are very understanding of the need for taking time to do the right thing, to build trust to allow things to evolve as they should, caring for country and knowing that we are country. We're not separate to her. Now, I did notice that among your many organisations and roles that you belong to, Chair of One Million Women. So I just wanted to ask, what has your experience been as a woman architect? Personally, I have grew up in quite a misogynistic, um, larger family, so I, I had some tactics for dealing with 
with that framework. And yep. but I also had some very um, amazing people that I worked with where that was, so I don't feel that I personally have been set back by that yep. misogynism, but I have witnessed it a lot. And, um, and it's kind of like a thriving system. If one group of people do are favoured and another one aren't, it's not a healthy system. Both men and women bring really interesting and different approaches. The most healthy ecosystem is one that's quite diverse. It's not only diverse in gender, it's diverse in thinking from different nations, from different viewpoints, all sorts of different viewpoints. And I think if you want a business to do well, you don't just get a whole bunch of people who think exactly the same way. Yeah, I see that argument come up a lot when you talk about increasing diversity, that, you know, like we want to have the best person for the role. And I feel like that often misses the point. Well, what is the best person? You know, like yeah, <laughs> if you're defining best by most like me, then that's a very self-limiting approach. Whereas if you describe the best for the thriving overall system, then you'll say, well, where are the gaps here? Who is not at the table that we need at the table? Yeah. Who are these voices that will enrich our system? And I think you'll find business councils all over are doing analysis and showing that companies without women on their boards are doing the worst. Yeah. But I think you'll find that when you've got that diversity at the decision-making levels, you will find a lot more success in a lot more ways. Yeah, I think that, that there are definitely benefits to be had from increasing that diversity. And I've started teaching architecture at the University of Newcastle in 1993. Oh, <laughs> I lived in Newcastle. <laughs> the Vice Chancellor of the University then, Raoul Mortley, was trying to get more women involved through the university because he recognised how important that was. And as a yep. town that kind of was based on BHP, it was a very blokey place. Yep. <laughs> And through a, an initiative he introduced, I ended up as the most junior staff member, but the only full-time female member of staff on the Faculty of Architecture. Wow. I ended up representing, being one of the two representatives along with the Dean, representing architecture on the Academic Senate. And through that initiative that he, he, he said, basically every faculty should be represented by a Dean and where the Dean is not a woman one of the two other representatives shall be a woman if she nominates or is nominated. So suddenly we went from, I think, having less than 5% of Academic Senate being women to about 30%. The women who had been there before just said it was a new world. Suddenly they were actually able to talk in the Senate and their ideas were actually listened to and discussed. It just shows you, you know, was I a better representative than my boss who was the head of architecture or was I as a young female lecturer an important voice to have at that table? Yeah. It's not about best or better. It's just about who are the voices that you need and how does that enrich the whole system? The fact that best is a prejudged set of values that we go, yep, those metrics are how we decide best, but rethinking those is something that we need to do I think <laughs> and you did also mention that you were a witness to misogyny in the architectural space are there any experiences that you feel comfortable sharing or? I, I can't tell you how many meetings I went to you know on various boards and other things or places where I was maybe the only woman or one of two yep I remember one particular conversation where the person felt that you know the, the young woman had not stood up for herself and so she deserved to be taken advantage of from a pay point of view and other things. And you just go, wow, you know, why do you think she didn't stand up for herself? Maybe she was hoping to keep a job. <laughs> <laughs> that might get you a little bit of advantage for a while, but it's so not the right thing to do and it's so not going to do well for you in the longer term. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh... and I think that was a very typical thing. Women are such assets, <laughs> and I mean, <laughs> yeah, everyone generally is an asset. They will bring a different approach to the thinking, to the design, to ideas, and that's a really good thing. Women make up half of the world, and if you don't have women designing the buildings that we're using, well, even know, just putting their viewpoint in, you know, yeah. <laughs> You know, Apple watches and apparently someone said, oh, maybe we should monitor menstrual cycles. 
And they said, why would you do that? It's only for a minority. <laughs> Literally half the population is yeah, such a- not a minority. But I also just think that many quieter voices or others are not often heard or given the space or even given the recognition at time and in a timely way where their voices can really contribute to the design. A couple of years ago, we were involved in this very collaborative design process for a building. To make it work, because we were trying to achieve living building challenge for it, I said, we need to get the entire team here from the start. <clears throat> we need to get a builder. We need to get the engineer. We need to do all these people. And the engineer, who was very used to being given a design and going, can you go and work that out later down the field? He just said, so what do you want me to do here, Caroline? And I just said, we want your intelligence and expertise now before we make decisions. We want you to say, that's getting really complicated because guess what? That's going to get really expensive. Or how can we make this simpler? Or how can we do this? And this has transformed how he's worked. Really? And he now realises the agency he has, if he comes in earlier, to have more creative conversations around decisions around structure that will totally impact the complexity of the project, which equals cost. And if you get in earlier, his value and input is so much higher. We've all got to get Indigenous knowledge in earlier because you might even go, you know what, we shouldn't be building that on this site. Maybe we should be thinking differently. Or if we are building something like that, maybe on that part of the site over there or Maybe we can think of it differently so that in its design and evolution, it can help enrich site, enrich country through these ways. I suppose that really like embodies what sustainability is about in a way because you're considering more stakeholders. But also acknowledging their contribution and inviting that contribution and being willing to change what outcome might evolve through contribution. You know, I remember when people were talking about Council House 2 when they did that in the early 90s and they were getting the cleaners in to talk about what makes it easier for them to clean a building because they do it every day. That's really good, yeah. You know, and the certifier, what what was going to make, you know, and it wasn't about making their lives easy. It was about sometimes you make this decision and it has terrible impacts later down, which unless you're in that space and working on it, you probably don't realise. Yeah. It's not about driving a building design by unrealistic details. It's about enriching the design outcome and taking these on board and finding ways forward where those things are no longer problems. Makes a lot of sense because you're designing for people. Now, you mentioned a living building. What is a living building? So the Living Building Challenge was developed in Northwest America by Jason McLennan and, and a whole bunch of people around him. And the idea behind it was that every act of development should be positive and regenerative, not less bad, but actually really good. Right. They used a metaphor of a flower and they said, look, a flower finds its own little ecosystem. It works out how it can best grow there, where it'll best grow there. It finds all its own nutrients, its own water, its own energy. It produces no pollution and it's beautiful and brings delight. And the idea is why shouldn't every building be like that? Yeah, And it's a really beautiful idea that we should be creating buildings that can produce more than their own energy, that can treat, capture and treat their own water, that don't use toxic materials or create any toxic waste, that uses local knowledge and local things and understands the microclimate, where you should build and where you shouldn't build. And they should be beautiful so that people fall in love with them and want to use them and look after them. That's lovely, like adding something positive to the environment. And one of their big things is don't build on greenfield sites because the human race has taken more than their fair share of ecosystems across the world. We should be using our work to improve the areas we've already damaged and making them better make it healthy and thriving and able to contribute to the larger ecosystem. The challenge of repairing an ecosystem, the lessons that you can learn from doing that are going to be so important. It's not that hard. It is possible. I mean, Singapore is totally greening their environment because they worked out they were very dense and and it was hard and people weren't happy. And now they've got this idea that they are a city in a park, not parks in a city. Yeah. Using nature to help enrich every building. I've seen a lot of buildings where they have greenery coming out of them. 
I've heard criticism that those aren't very practical in terms of putting the greenery in the buildings because they don't actually thrive in that environment naturally. Is that a valid criticism? I think that every application of greenery needs to be considered for its specific microclimate and what it's doing, and you need to make sure that there's adequate soil for the root balls. I mean, it's not like you just go slap it on. Right. It's got to be a very localised approach. And I think that people can go, it doesn't do any difference. Well, nature is not just all about human beings. It's actually about all the other species. And if we can create spaces where the other species are more comfortable and more able to thrive, that is a really good thing. Do you have any suggestions for how to encourage people to make that connection with nature? Because I encounter a lot of people who would prefer, I think, to just shut nature out and not have it come inside their built environment. I think they should go and spend some time in nature. (laughs) And I think that's what actually a lot of people did over COVID when they were not able to go very far and they found that being in their parks or in their beaches and other places was just really, really good for their mental health and well-being. Yeah. If you can bring some of that back into your homes and into your offices and make it more connected and more thriving, then that's good. And I just think they've just got to go step by step and then they will find that joy of nature. That's, (laughs) I hope so. And if they don't, they'll just get left behind while everyone else does. So (laughs) I guess this sort of like a carry on effect where eventually they'll catch on. I also wanted to know, like beyond having things like solar panels and batteries and maybe some insulation, what are some of the non-obvious factors that make a home sustainable? First of all, the idea of improving the whole building envelope to make it more energy efficient, sealing up gaps, putting more insulation in, making the windows better perform is one place to start. There's so many other things about how do you grow food in your garden or in on, on your balcony, which is great because it gives you some resilience on the food front and it's great to see things grow and understand the, the cycles of life. And it brings greenery and diversity and bees and other things there. And then you've got to think about the materials you use in your place and make sure you don't use toxic materials. And that is so much harder than it should be. And another really important one is to actually use local people and local materials so that you invest in the economy and ecology of your place, so that you use materials and ideas that are local to your place, so that you help understand the place that you're in, but you also help the other people in that area to thrive because together we are a stronger community and if we keep going off to buy things cheap things from somewhere else which is probably coming from people being abused just quietly that's not a good thing whereas if you get someone from the local thing to use their timber that they've just cut down and build something beautiful and people go oh well it's too expensive I can't afford it and it's like well we we need to stop saying the cheapest thing is what we can afford. If you can't do everything, then do less and do it really well and help the social systems around you to thrive because a resilient community is a really important thing, particularly as we face a pretty tricky future. You've got to help them be strong. Lismore is an area that was built on a floodplain. Is there a strategic or governmental level of strategy that needs to be applied to things like that to make sure that we're not having more situations like that where a whole town just gets destroyed? I just think the strategic decision is to move people out of the floodplain because it's only going to keep happening. Yeah. And that's a big decision and it's a hard decision, but the sooner you make it, the less damage of people and psyches and community is going to happen in the future. And part of that is because people have developed land in the whole watershed in ways that it can't absorb that rain as much. And I think that we need to work out how to salvage the materials from the floodplains and reuse them in new locations, how we identify locations that are going to be safe from the floods. And then how do we use the floodplains in ways that are okay when it does flood. I mean, you know, the Nile Valley for years loved the floods because it brought nutrients from upstream down and made it richer for growing food. So, you know, we've just got to do that. And 
I they go, well, you can't do it. Well, why can't you do it? Usually it's expensive and they don't want to. It's, it's- yeah, but, you know, and that's the thing is, okay, well, work out how you do it, but you can't rebuild in a place <laughs> that's just going to flood again. Like this year it's flooded three times. Yeah. You know, like, hello. I mean, <laughs> maybe it won't flood next year, but it's going to keep flooding. I suppose part of the step is going to have to be looking at what other areas should also consider relocating because, I mean, I imagine that it's going to be easier to salvage and move houses and building materials while they're not flood damaged. I just think this idea that human beings should be able to build wherever they like regardless of the ecology around them is bizarre because nature is stronger than all of us. And as we've seen in the last couple of years, she kind of wins. (laughs) Yeah, well, that's the thing. It's like you can build here if you want, but, I mean, it's not a good idea. (laughs) You're just throwing good money after bad. And I think, you know, I remember listening to a radio program about an area that flooded upstream from Brisbane and council said, well, we'll move people, you know, and they did some, I don't know what the deal was, but people could move out of the flood area and up to higher land. And some people felt that they couldn't afford it and they weren't sure that they needed to. And guess what? It flooded again this year and the people up higher were safe and the people down low were going, oh, my God, I'm here again. I just want to move. Yeah, I think it's frustrating as well because the reality is it's happening and it's going to keep happening and you could say that it's expensive to help them before it happens, but it's also expensive to deal with the fallout afterwards. More expensive and more damaging for the people. And, you know, I think one of the most appalling things that's happening at the moment is the idea that there's a number of sites on the Hawkesbury floodplains that people, developers still think they should be able to develop on. You know, after all of this flooding, like no (laughs) houses at all should be able to be built there. I don't care whether they think they've got the right, they don't. And building a a slightly bigger wall in the Warragamba Dam will not stop that flooding and it will destroy a whole lot of Indigenous heritage that is beyond valuable and it's not going to stop the flooding because the water is coming from everywhere else as well. Yeah. Planning ministers need to take really brave decisions and go, guess what? There are certain places you cannot build. I guess you have to at some point protect people from bad decision making because it's not just themselves that get impacted. I read that you have drawn on feminism in your design. What connections do you see between feminism and sustainable design? During lockdown, I read a book called Cassandra Speaks. Okay. One of the stories that stuck with me most was we've all been told that, you know, when we face a big threat, our reactions are fight, flight or freeze. Well, apparently in about 1995, some women were doing some research into that and found out that the only people who'd been surveyed to come up with that were men. (laughs) And that when you started talking to women, their reactions were more about tend and befriend because often they were looking after people who were not able to fight or flee and would die if they froze. And so they realised that they needed to tend, as in actually understand, really understand the situation they're in and what was happening, and in anticipation build friendships with people to reduce the problem or the potential of those threatening situations. Right. And I just think that there's also another movement that's happening around the world or a discussion called rematriation. And rematriation is a return to that really caring, more motherly approach where you understand the importance of the economy, but that's not the aim of the house. You know, the house is actually to provide a caring and beautiful place. And I just think that all of our designs, all of the built environment needs to be have a whole lot more of that rematriation so that we create better places for people to live and work and play in going into the future where they can make a stronger, a more resilient community of people. It's a really beautiful concept. It shows that there's like a real absence of warmth without that consideration. Also the connection to sustainability as a movement, ending and befriending to nature and having that relationship is something that 
we need to do as a society. Because I think also sustainability isn't enough. Sustainability is about sustaining. That's why we focus on thriveability. It's so beyond beyond that. Go beyond. (laughs) It requires a whole lot of tending and caring. Yes. All that to happen. It doesn't come from a command and control approach. No, absolutely not. It's definitely from a place of compassion and warmth and building, enabling (laughs) stronger connections. I'm losing light here. (laughs) Yeah, it's getting dark. Um, (laughs) But thank you so much for coming and joining me tonight. It was a real pleasure to talk to you.